Today's guest on the What Fuels You podcast is Richard Galanti. Richard joined Costco Wholesale Corporation in March 1984 as Vice President Finance and became Senior Vice President and Chief Financial Officer of Costco in January 1985. In 1993, Mr. Galanti became Executive Vice President and CFO, a position he continues to hold today. In 1995, he also became Director of the company. Prior to Costco, Richard was in investment banking with Donaldson, Lufkin, and Genret Securities Corporation in New York, where the last transaction he worked on in late 1983 was a private equity financing for a little-known startup company located in Seattle called Costco. Richard received his MBA from the Stanford University Graduate School of Business and his BS in Economics from the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. He has also served a nine-year term on the Board of Federal Reserve Bank of San Francisco and has been on the Foster School of Business Executive Education Advisory Board since 2000. Welcome, Richard. So good to see you. How are you? I'm good. I'm going to hit you with some rapid fire to kick us off. Sounds good. Given that you are like... I'm sure people who all know you know this, that you're hilarious, but I'm going to start with, who's your favorite comedian? Who's my favorite? George Wallace used to be my favorite comedian, although I haven't seen him in a long time. And if you don't know George Wallace, uh, he was uh, good friends with Jerry Seinfeld when Jerry was doing stand-up, and he was just uh, fun. Yeah, I got it, and I have to search it up. Um, Okay, what movie can you recite the most lines from? Dirty Harry. <laughs> <laughs> Love it. What's your pet peeve? Having to get up too early in the morning to go on a long walk, exercise walk. That's but once I do it, I feel great about it. Your pet peeve is when someone makes you do it? Right. Uh, a number of years ago, my wife hired a trainer for me, like at 6 a.m., three days a week. And each night before about 11 p.m., I would be cursing. Why did I agree to do this? Yeah. But it's then the once I did it, it was about, you feel great. So yeah, I totally the short agree. term, short term pet peeve. Yeah. What is the most frequently asked question that you get about Costco? Well, generally it's why did they stop selling something? You know, oh. I went back and, and the white fish salad's no longer there, or this item is no longer there. And I told I usually my response is this is being well, you weren't buying enough of it. <laughs> exactly. Hey, that's funny. Um, okay, if you could be famous as an athlete, performer, actor, musician, or comedian, what would you choose? Jesus, that's a hard one. Um, well, when somebody asks me, what would I be doing if I wasn't doing this, or what would I love to do? I do have a sense of humor. I'm relatively quick with it, which helps me with my lack of managerial skills. But I always thought it'd be fun to be a comedic talk show host like Jimmy Kimmel. You'd be so good at it. That's why it's in there. I mean, it's specifically, this is a question for you. I haven't asked any other guests and I've had like 150 on so far yeah. about being a comedian, but I just, I feel like I would go to see you. You always make me laugh, like belly. Laugh. I will put you on. I will put you on the list. <laughs> put me on the to list. Invite, invite you. List. <laughs> get me, get me in VIP. What's a quality that you most value in a friend? I think being a friend, no matter what. Um, I have a friend back east uh, who's done incredibly crazy well in life, and uh, Barry, my wife, and I were back for his 60th birthday party a few years ago. And I hadn't seen him, I hadn't seen him, but I hadn't seen his kids in a number of years. And his oldest kid, who's in his mid to late 20s, said, I got to tell you, my dad told me you're one of his three best friends, which I was surprised because we don't see each other all the time. And I said, really? And he says, yeah, because I asked him once, if, if he lost everything, who would still be your friend? And he, 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 the compliment was, is he said, I would be one of those three. Right. No matter what happened, I'd still be his friend. So I think right. that's what I like to see in friends. You're in it for the right reasons. There's no agenda. You just love the person authentically. I love it. What's a big misconception about you? I, I think work-wise that I'm a great manager. Uh, I I remember when I first got here, you know, six months later, uh, the controller, accounting controller had quit out of frustration two months prior to my arrival. My predecessor was being fired. And the first order of business was to hire a controller. We hired a great guy. Who, I was 27. Uh, he was 53, I think. He was from a 300 store discount cha- short chain in the middle in Columbus, Ohio, 
owned by Macy's or Federated, whatever the name of it, he called uh, Gold Circle, no longer around. And uh, and I remember when he came here, this is 1983, startup company salaries and everything, but we agreed to give him, and he took a pay cut and he did fine on stock, uh, but we agreed that we'd give him his first salary increase. We'd give him two in the first 12 months, so in six months and six months. And six months hence, I go to our founder and my boss, Jim Senegal, and said, this guy's doing a great job. He's fantastic. And Jim agreed. What do you want to take him to? And, you know, if the two founders of the company were making 75 and I was probably making 55 and the three warehouses that we had out in operation in Seattle, Portland, and Spokane, uh, those three warehouse managers were making 45. This guy came in making 40. And I said, well, I'd like to take him to 50. And Jim looked up and he says, 50? That's more than our warehouse managers make. And I'm thinking to myself, McFly, this is a guy that's a VP, ran a 300-store VP of operations and data processing back then, or IT. And uh, and he's he's more than a store manager for crying out loud. And I've come to realize the ability to manage is 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 a skill that part of it you're you're, you're born with, and part of it you can improve on. And I always thought of myself as going from a, a C minus to a B plus, perhaps over time. But learning how to be a manager, and uh, and I, I know that I, you have to hire good people. I think I've done a good job at that. But uh, I think that's that would be my answer. Yeah, I actually, I I actually interviewed someone um, recently on the podcast and asked about like what his kind of ninja special sauce skill set was. And he said, recognizing other people's talent, which I I think is actually is a skill set. And maybe that just makes you shine as a manager. (laughs) Like it actually wasn't me. I'm just good at hiring better people. The other thing I learned over time, uh, and I learned it from my original boss, Jim, for the first 28 years of my career here and from others as well, uh, speaking in words of speaking being transparent and honest and speaking in words of one, you know, direct in words of one syllable, if you will. Yeah. Um, it, it, particularly when you're giving somebody a review and it's not all good, but they're nice and you hate to t- give them the bad, him or her the bad news. Uh, it's, a, it's, 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 it's something I've learned to be a lot better with over time because sugarcoating the stuff, you don't have to be brutally honest, but sugarcoating something sometimes isn't good for that person or for you. Right. That, that's also another skill. Yeah. Where did you learn some of this stuff? I mean, do you have any um, recollection of learning any of these values? I know that you come from an entrepreneurial family. You guys were in the grocery store retail business. Did you, did, did you watch your family kind of be good leaders or is this just something that you picked up while at DLJ and Costco? Look, I, I think, look, I grew up in a large uh, uh, Sephardic, my big fat Greek wedding family, if you will but from Turkey, but my dad was one of four brothers. He's 90, the other three are deceased, but they had four little stores and all the cousins grew up, you know, bagging groceries and stocking shelves. And these were small grocery stores. And so we learned customer service and work ethic and certainly a good work ethic from my dad and my uncles. But I think, I think I, I, I learned it from here over the years. I mean, the, the, the things that Costco is known for, not just in terms of success and great products and everything, but how it treats its employees, uh, how it, it, it's customer service, even though it's a self-service business. Uh, those are the kinds of things that I think I've learned here. Yeah. And how would you describe your upbringing? Was it, um, you know, obviously went on to go to, to Penn to Wharton, which is like my dream school for my kid. I don't know if any of them will get in, but um, well, was, was, school, was school a big value? Was there pressure to do well in school? Look, I, I grew up, you know, in some ways, in a fortunate setting, you know, with mom and dad and an oldest of three three siblings, and certainly education was important. Notwithstanding the fact that neither of my parents went to college, it was a different generation, and they both you know worked hard from when they were ten and twelve years old or whatever. But we grew up basically, I'd say, going from middle class to maybe upper middle class. We drove to vacations. We didn't fly off to vacations. Uh, you know, but we had everything. You know, yeah. it was a loving family. And I, I think personally, uh, I, you know, I always joked that I made a, not only A's in classes, but A's in conduct back when they had, that was one of your elementary school grades, which allowed me to really have a lot of F's in conduct, but my parents never knew. So <laughs> in terms of, you know, I, I, so I, I was able to do things that could get you in trouble that you, you didn't get in trouble because you yeah. were smart. And, uh, but you, know, you, you say getting, getting into Wharton, Look, I was always strong in math and science and very weak and lazy in reading. And uh, in fact, when I was a senior in high school, 
I think every senior in high school took the SATs, even if you weren't going to college, you took it as part of your public school curriculum. And while I was off the charts on the top, you know, 99th percentile, whatever math, I was 47th percentile in verbal. Because oh, uh, jokingly, my food and anybody who's a little older would know my two favorite authors were uh, Cliff and Monarch and uh, Cliff Notes and Monarch Notes. And, and, and I did everything impossible to get around taking courses. Yeah, little right? shortcuts. Right. And then I got a job on Wall Street. This is great. I don't have to, I can calculate shit, not, not have to write stuff. Right. Boy, yeah, you, you found your right lane. So well, were there... I didn't, but I didn't because what you find is, is everything in life is about communicating and writing and and, and verbal verbalizing. And so uh, it, that was painful at first, but I learned how to do that. So your your family, like, um, how would you describe kind of your core family values, and how has that informed um, how you've raised your own kids? Well, I, look, I, I, I'm fortunate. Uh, my parents are 89 and 90; they're still together. Um, uh, the, uh, again, my dad was one of five siblings, uh, you know, whose, whose father I never met. My grandfather was a shoe cobbler when he came to the country and learned to trade. And, uh, and my dad worked six days a week and got home at eight o'clock at night from the grocery store, uh, most nights. And so we didn't have dinner together. Uh, and, uh, but we were always together and on weekends and stuff. Uh, but it, look, I was very fortunate. It was, a, it was a, a loving family with a, with a, a strong work ethic. And uh, I think uh, in many ways that was fortunate. Strong yeah. family value, strong family. My grandmother, my dad's mom was very much the matriarch of the family. And uh, the one holiday we all go back to Atlanta from all over the country is the first night of Passover for the big Seder, the big dinner. And literally it's about a hundred people all related. So my dad's one of five. I'm one of 15 first cousins of those five. Wow. We, 15 of us have 36 children. My 20 year old daughter is the youngest and the oldest is about 50. Wow. Uh, I didn't know this for sure. I did not know. Yeah. 15 or so of them now are married with kids. And my three kids think of those other 33 of that group of 36, not of my cousin's kids, but as their cousins. Yeah, of course. And and so I I feel very lucky in that regard. And and Gary came from a close family as well um, in terms of, uh, going away on vacations and uh and uh yeah and my family my family is close but we're small david has 27 right. first cousins so similar to his mom's like one of nine and his dad's one of four i mean it's it's a big family and but, i love 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 it look at the end of the day again i i've used the word lucky and fortunate it was lucky it was a a, a pretty cool family to be part of uh we weren't perfect by any stretch of the imagination but having that closeness is, is is unique, and I feel very fortunate in that regard. Yeah. Now, how do you bring that to the next generation? That's hard. Um, we've got three great kids, you know, but there's challenges all the time with everything. Of course. And so you said you grew up in a Sephardic family and that your family celebrated Passover. Did you have a strong um, Jewish community in Atlanta? I, I guess I don't know much about the Jewish community in Atlanta. Well, it wasn't like L.A. or New York or Chicago or something. But the, the Sephardic community, which tends to be you know, Spanish, uh, Mediterranean, Turkish, Greek Jews, yeah. uh, tend to be have their own setting eyes, if you will, when they came to America. And so I grew up in a very strong, closely knit Sephardic community. Yeah. That being said, uh, as we moved during grade school and high school into the neighborhood of 10 miles that way or 10 miles that way, you were friends with everybody. Right. Uh, but I think there was a, there was that a little bit of that culture uh, that you have that you look back on very fondly. Yeah. Did you remember what you wanted to be when you grew up? I know you're strong math and science. You went to work. I think I always knew I wanted to do, you know, when I said I, said I was strong, strong in math and science, I never saw myself being a doctor because I couldn't even step on a bug. Uh, it's gross. <laughs> and, you know, the blood. And shit. I don't mind stepping on a bug, but I don't like blood at all. Right. And uh, so I, I, you know, having grown up in a small family business, and being good at math, I guess I always thought I'd be, yeah. you know, going doing something in business. I had no idea what. Never did I imagine the journey that I've actually been on. Yeah. And, you know, you get back to going to Wharton. I remember my sophomore year, first semester, you have to go meet with a counselor to see what you're, you're going to uh, uh, major in. And in my grades were great. I did great grades. And, and I walk into this office and this guy's about 40 and he looks like Gene Shallot, for those of you who are old enough to know Gene Shallot was kind of a pale faced academic guy with a big mustache and a big lot of hair. And he's got my folder open and it's got my, no doubt my high school grades, my first year grades, which were very good as well. 
and my poor SAT score. And it, the first thing he said is, how did you get in here with your <laughs> SAT it. score? And I remember on my, you know, quick witted, I said, I guess the person that read my essays, dad had a grocery store. Because I talked about learning how to be a manager and working in the, growing up in the grocery store business. And so you realize that it's, things happen for different reasons. There were several lesser schools that I got turned down from. So you realize in life, you work hard and you create your own good luck. And it's a combination yeah. of hopefully some skills and good luck. But we all know people that are smarter and more talented than us that didn't do as well. And people right, that are of course. less smart, less talented than, that are doing better. So who knows? Right. So you got recruited, I, I'm guessing, because I did a lot of recruiting in New York and that, that whole like go to school and the consulting firms and the banks come and recruit off campus. So did you interview, you know, across the board in investment banking or this DLJ? Is a little different. What yeah. drew you to DLJ? Well, I, gra- I was class of 78 and graduated in, tw- in December of 77. In early 77, it was the first year that Wall Street had a new entry-level position. Prior to that, it was the MBA associate. Mm. In 1977, Dean, Dean Witter, actually, in Morgan Stanley, each hired literally three or four of these newfangled positions called analysts. Yeah. It was a two-year deal, and then go back to business school, do whatever you want. And so here I am in January and February of 78 on a friend's couch, somebody who was a year older than me that already graduated, with a list of the top 50 bank investment banks. And I think DLJ was like 46 or whatever. And <laughs> no, I, it wasn't I Goldman called, or JP Morgan. I, I called them all. I got a lot of interviews. Several said, we like you. Come back in April when we know how many of these newfangled positions we're going to interview for. Uh, a few said, good luck to you. We're not interested. And DLJ said, when can you start? And so it was really that fortuitous. And I thought, by the way, I wanted to go work for a big firm and do big deals. And boy, was I lucky I got to go to DLJ, not just because of how that where ended up. But, you know, when you were working 80, 90, literally 80, 90 hours a week on big deals as the analyst, you were spending your nights at three in the morning at, at printers, proofreading documents. Yeah. Yeah. That's what you were learning how to do. Uh, I was working with small entrepreneurs of startup companies. So it, in a way, it was, it was a fortune. It was a good, not because I knew what I was doing. It was because that was the job that I was offered. In, incredible foundation for your career, for sure. And so you went to, back to Stanford to get an MBA. Um, yeah. I, I always ask people that have an MBA, of course, it's Stanford, Harvard. Those schools are like, well, why wouldn't you? Of course. Some people who go get an MBA at some random school, I'm always like, why even do that? As a recruiter, I'm like, it doesn't necessarily impact you. Yeah. Um, What's, what's your opinion if you're giving advice to your kids or your friends, your kids' friends about going back to get an MBA? Well, it depends. You know, in certain fields, it's almost required. When I was doing very well for those two and a half years after undergraduate at DLJ, you know, you work like a law firm, you work on different projects with different partners. Half of them said you really need to go back and get it because it could hurt you if you didn't have it one day. And half of them said you don't need to go back. But frankly, getting them to offer to pay for half of it if I came back and not having to work 80 hours a week for a couple of years and, and you know, basically right. taking naps in the afternoon after four hours of classes sounded pretty enticing. So I applied, having gone to work undergrad, I applied to two schools. Fortunately, I got into one and the next day I got the no thank you letter from the other. There are a lot of great business schools out there, yeah. a lot of other ways, but it, it partly depends on what you're looking to do in life. Yeah. And it, well, there's a few industries that it's traditional. Um, there's some great management oriented schools that are, you know, very good as well. Yeah. So my advice is when you're 50, it's not, it, it's, it's going to matter if it, it I, I do think it helps you in your career. Well, and it definitely helps see, if it's Stanford. I mean, as a recruiter, we see recognizable names, like, of course it's like, and it, and the network, how, how strong has the network been at Wharton undergrad versus Stanford MBA? Are they both just super robust and helpful to you as far as well i'm sure they're catch. super robust but getting back to costco's culture and our arrogant simplicity that i talked about we don't hire mbas i always said jim uh, jim lightly despite the fact that i had an mba jim our founder and uh literally we don't recruit on college campuses at business schools uh, everybody's grown up from within so we're a really unique specimen in that regard and by the way it's worked it's worked wonderfully Stock yeah. at another all time high today. So uh, I they, know I was so excited. I'm like, of all days, I get to interview you. Yeah. And my my quite one of my questions was like, how much does that impact your mood when you wake up? Do you look at the stock price every day? I mean, well, of course you look at it, but it really doesn't affect you. I mean, you have to it, look. 
uh, we went public in 85, so it's 36 years ago. Um, the stocks, you know, back, what was it, back, uh, it's probably six years now when the day, our stock was at, at that all, roughly all-time high of, uh, I want to say about 180, 190. And uh, and uh, the announcement that came across the tape that day was that Amazon was buying Whole Foods. And I remember Jim Cramer talking about this is a day, this will go down as a day of infamy for companies like Costco and Target and Kroger. Nick, apparently not. not. From, and our stock went from 185 to 150 that day, you know, down 20%. But the reality is, is you have to look yourself in the mirror. How do you feel about the company over the next five and 10 years? And, and understand the stock will fluctuate, but how yeah. do you feel about it long-term? It's yeah. how we buy stock as a company back. We buy every day. We buy a little more if it goes down and a little less if it goes up. And when something like that happened, we greatly increased it. Uh, and we don't know which way it's We never can pick the exact day, nor should we. But at the end of the day, we look at, we do look at ourselves in the mirror, if you will, and say, you know, how do we feel about our competitive position and our growth prospects over the next five and 10 years? And if we feel good about what we're doing, then we should continue to buy stock along the way. Yeah. And what? how far out are you looking as far as different? I know you obviously have incredible products and to even get a product into Costco is near impossible. The scrutiny within which you look at ingredients and fair business practices and just all of it. Somebody has to be pretty like on their game right. in order to, ser- to, to well, sell their products in there. Yeah. Sure. Well, there's a couple of things. First of all, if you go into a, a QFC or, or Safeway, there's probably 40 to 50,000 items on the shelves and lots of sizes and low salt and more salt and you know, different brands. If you go into a Walmart or, a, or, or Target or a Home Depot, there's 100,000 items. If you go into a Costco, even though there's everything from you know, diamonds to tires to mayonnaise, there's 3,800 items roughly. So it's a much limited selection. We don't have 20 different choices of canned peaches. We have one. And 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 it's a leading natural. But you have the best. That's that. I guess is my. Point. We have, we 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 curate stuff, right? We have the best, hopefully, and the best value. And by doing that, all the operating efficiencies that come with that allow us to sell at lower price, much lower prices. Now, in terms of is it hard to get in? Of course, it's hard to get in. It's hard to get in. I'm sure at Kroger and Walmart too. But we do do things on a regional basis. We have eight. Geographically, we split our, the U.S. into eight regions, Canada into two, and other countries, each is a separate country, the other 10 countries. But at the end of the day, so we a lot of items that started, I mean, this is a silly one that I just comes to the top of my mind. It's that big jar, plastic jar of uh, of the uh, the pretzels with the peanut butter in the middle. Oh, those are so good. They're so I, good. Can't, I, I tell David, don't bring those home because I like binge them like a freak. They're so right. good. And that was an item that started in the Midwest on a local basis and the regional buyer picked it up and of course if the the jar that the regular retailers bought or the supermarket chains in the midwest bought was 20 ounces we did a 40 ounce or 50 ounce so you know it was two and a half times as tall for almost the same damn price because of the great savings that we provide that's an item that is sold in 12 countries worldwide because of costco how does that process process work, Richard? Like something starts regionally, and then you just see how it sells through, and then you go kind of well, test it U.S. first. And two, how does it work? Things. Well, two things. One is is it's, if if in fact it starts in a region, there are seven other U.S. regions, and typically the other regions are looking at all the region share. What what are your new items, and how are they doing? In addition. We're a little odd. Instead of having 12 months in our year, we have 13 four-week periods because we like to compare Saturdays to Saturdays, not 31st to 31st and everything. There's a, a different kind of retail calendar that gets there to, to the same way, but this is how we do it. So 13 times a year, we close our fiscal periods on a Sunday. By Monday afternoon, anybody with P&L responsibility, whether it's a buyer, an operator, a manufacturing business, gets their P&Ls. By Thursday, they do updates for the upcoming three four-week periods going out. The following Tuesday and half of Wednesday, which was this week, we have a, a day and a half budget meeting. Pre-COVID, we've got 150, 160 people from all over the world in the same room. And by the way, pitting the person that runs Australia or Spain, they're schlepping here every four weeks. And they're doing, in fact, the Australia one, it's the first time he's been here in 22 months because Australia just got unlocked. Yeah, exactly. Like so, I think November 1st, right? But while they're while he or she is here, they're also meeting for a couple of days with the buyers and talking about things. 
at the meetings, it's not just, it's a small piece of each of these regions times is talked about looking at the numbers. That's easy to do. And a couple of key things we look at that every region talks about like percent of full-time and, 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 and part-time uh, overtime hours, you know, uh, end cap displays in terms of if we're charging a vendor for an end cap display, we want to self-police that and make sure we're doing it. And the, the warehouse didn't forget to put it down. But more importantly is the 10 minutes each one of these spends on merchandising things. What has worked, what hasn't worked, new things they've tried, what Sam's has, what so-and-so, what, you know, what Harrods yeah. has, uh, you know, what you saw at the fancy food show. And it's really that basic and iterative that we do. And yeah. it works. Are you guys still doing well. samples since, since uh, COVID? We're doing some samples, but they're all mostly dry samples or little physical packs. Little, like stuff. little things we can take. Yeah. I right. haven't been into a Costco. Actually, I have during COVID, but I, I just occurred to me, I don't think I saw any, any samples. So I'm yeah, guessing they're, they're that Saturday. Little, and we're now putting tables back out at the food yeah. courts. Yeah. Oh, I can't wait. Those ice creams on those hot dogs. Like <laughs> About six, probably about six months ago on uh, Mad Money with Kramer and the other guys, they were talking about COVID and when's it going to end. This is before the Delta variant shortchanged that end. And uh, and Kramer goes, I'll tell you when we know that COVID is over. It's when they bring back food samples at Costco. <laughs> exactly. That's awesome. I didn't hear that. Um, yes. Yeah, so sometimes, Dave, that would be our outing with the kids. Be like, who wants to go to Costco for the, how much does that impact the sell-through of those items? Like, have, do you do, obviously, you analyze that? Sure. Well, first of all, we charge to do it. Uh, and so it's it's a it's a just like retailers put certain things on display or end caps, yeah. all those or monies that come into the system, but particularly on new items, you know. And we've got some. We always have some really great quality new items in refrigerated and frozen, and, and, and on the food side. And so uh, it, it's it, it's a big lift. I mean, it, you know, you'll sell. Well, first of all, it's a new item. If you would have sold X, you'll sell you'll sell ten to twenty X. And that oh wow! Times. So you're getting people to try it. And if they try it, more people are going to pick it up. You know, yeah. the average Costco has something like 3,500 customers coming in every day. Yeah. It's and look, the biggest day of the week is Saturday, I'm guessing, because you said you did. The biggest day per hour is Sunday. Saturday and Sunday are busy, but Sunday's probably even a little busier. I think Saturday people are doing other errands. and uh, But whatever, Saturday and Sunday are both busy per yeah. hour. You said that you promote people from within, and that's kind of your thing, not going for the MBAs, kind of homegrown. What's the craziest story that you've seen in those? I mean, you came in at kind of an executive level. Are there people that start in the warehouse who are now executives that you've seen grow? And if so, oh, Greg what's, Jody, their, what's seen, their, their on, I guess they're um, on the job MBA. Well, uh, Craig Jonick, our CEO and pres present CEO for my boss for the last 11 years since Jim retired, uh, he started in, in, in a warehouse. Now, in fairness, he had worked for 10 years down in San Diego at, at a company called FedMart, uh, which was a, a predecessor company to, to the Price Club, uh, and where many of the original 10 or 12 Mohicans, they, including Jim and some others, came up here in their early 40s to start Costco. And so they knew him. And that first year, they asked him, hey, this thing's working. We need some warehouse managers. Why don't you come up? So, but more importantly, if you think we have, we have 820 Costcos, I think, around the world, uh, so 820 warehouse managers, he or she, 75% uh, of them started pushing carts and cashiering and stocking shelves. The average tenure when a warehouse manager be, was promoted to the warehouse manager level is 16 years. Oh my gosh. And, and, and now that's a job that all in pays about 400 grand. It's a real job that, you know, he or she is managing a nearly $300 million building, 270, $280 million facility with 250 to 450 employees with three or 4,000 customers a day coming in That's insane. with food safety and HACCP and HIPAA and privacy and slip and falls and inventory shrinkage and safety. And, and now, way, and now supply and chain, massive money. supply chain issues. Right. Now. And by the way, makes and all the shit that goes on with having to deal with customers that are not happy because they have yeah. to wear a boss or something. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's a very, you know, one of the key slides in the PowerPoint from Jim for 28 years and for Craig for the last 11 years is to, you know, don't be, all the cliches, but they really do work. Don't be arrogant. Don't be complacent. Remain hardworking and innovative. 
Uh, operate, uh, my favorite that, uh, from many years ago, uh, operate in a healthy state of paranoia. Uh, <laughs> I actually think that's perfect. It is. I mean, you know, as a retailer, one, every time you try something new, everybody else, every other competitor can look at it the next day. And two, you're standing there waiting for a customer to come in. Yeah. So, but, but, but the key word there is healthy. And yeah. then the last phrase is have fun. You know, when I speak, I have the opportunity many times to speak to college students, to MBA students, to executive MBAs, and to other groups like a great group locally, nationally, but I work with here is called Europe. Uh, where, oh, I you know, didn't. I love Europe. That's amazing. I didn't know you were involved several, with that. There's several other great organizations like that. Yeah. I actually want to get to your origin story of, of Costco and your first kind of, I know that you covered them. You were um, working with them as a, as a banker. Um doing a deal with them, but like, what was the, what was their, their luring in process and why do you think they tapped you? And then finally, what was the interview process like? Well, again, it's so much less formal than you can imagine. Um, here I am on wall street, the traditional deal, you have an associate, the junior person or the MBA or the undergrad, you have a VP or whatever they call that person. And you have a partner or senior VP or managing director. That would be the typical team of three that works on a deal. And of course, uh, Jeff and Jim, the two founders, came to New York and interviewed three boutique investment banking firms as a private startup, DLJ, uh, Dylan Reed, and Kidder Peabody. All three are now part of bigger firms, uh, those three entities. Fortunately for me, they picked DLJ. Uh, we did a, what was referred to in the business as a Series A offering. It, typically, a company might start off doing what they call the friends and family round. Investors are your friends and your family. Uh, then they do an institution, a private institutional round called an A, and sometimes a B, C, D, and F before they go public, if they do go public. But at the end of the day, we worked on the Series A round. And I was the associate, so I was doing the, uh, I remember flying out here with those two people above me, sitting in the office at Fourth Avenue South with Jeff and Jim and the other seven or eight Mohicans that came from San Diego, mostly, and just talking about the you know, deal. Uh, and uh, so we could put together an offering document and raise money, which we then did. Um, it was at the closing dinner. That was in August of 83. September, October, and December of 83. Early December is when Costco opened Seattle, Portland, and Spokane yeah. warehouses. That was it. So we were engaged to do this before they opened the first one. At the closing dinner in mid-December, uh, Jeff and Jim said, hey, we're letting so-and-so go, the CFO. Wonder if you'd like to come out and work for us. And I said, wow. I mean, I hadn't thought about it, frankly. I was content being young, single, living in New York and working hard. Yeah, I was going to say, the Seattle part is the biggest part. Like, when I moved from New York, even though I'm from here, people were like, wait, Seattle? Like, Alaska? <laughs> right. Well, what's interesting is, is I, so I, basically, I tied into a trip that I was going to be here on a Friday in mid-January, where we sat down and talked and spoke, the three of us. And it was really pretty informal. I I remember calling him and saying, I, I think I, I'm leaning towards coming. Can we do an employment contract? And Jeff and Jim looked at each other and said, really? Well, sure. I said, never mind. I mean, that quickly. Because it was clear to me, first of all, I got a great feel having worked with Jeff and Jim during the process and traveled them a little bit, speaking to institutional investors in New York and L.A. and Boston and elsewhere. And uh, and uh but it was clear from the day I was here from that due, that eight hour due diligence meeting, so I could write an offering, help write an offering document. The people were just hardworking, down to earth people, and they worked together. I remember talking to my mentor, my dad's big business friend, Leo, who's also ninety and still alive. I love and it. I remember sending him the forty or sixty page document, the offer, the Series A offering document that describes the management, describes the concept as a picture of a warehouse or whatever. And because, you know, there was only eight, the industry was eight price clubs in Southern California, Southern, the Southwest United States. And, and, and I asked him, do you think it'll work? And he goes, look, it may or may not work. And these guys are in their early 40s, meaning they've been in retail for 20 years. It seems like it could work. But well, Jeff, had had, Jeff, Jeff had had some successes, some failures along the way, right. for sure. And at the end of the day, my downside was I could go back to DLJ for a third time. Totally. Back to Atlanta. But when you ask about, about moving to Seattle, I look back, people say, how did you know it was going to be successful? I said, I had no freaking idea. I figured I'd be here for two or three. Worst case, I'd be in one of the things that Leo said to me. Worst case, it doesn't work out. But in the next two years, what you're going to learn 
and I, I described it myself to friends on Wall Street. I said, it's like I have a completely new due diligence list of questions to ask people because I'm actually rolled up my sleeves and working in a business than just right. looking at the financial statements. Working on the business. So, yeah, you get to be, so be an operator. The only thing going to be useful and valuable to me as a person you know, pursuing a career and whatever irrespective of just getting another two years on Wall Street at the time. Yeah. And so, you know, to today, and, like with companies, there's all these discussions around like set out your values, your mission statement, get really clear on your DEI, you know, strategy and all these things that people are very intentional around. It seems like you guys were kind of like just organically birthing these ideas that have stuck for the many years that you've been there the whole time. Right. And, and, and it gets back to the people you deal with. And again, Looking around the room, and again, Jeff and Jim were both great. But we wouldn't be here today if it wasn't for Jeff meeting Jim and talking him into coming up to Seattle. You know, Jim really ran the business day to day as a merchant and operator, and uh, and he was my direct boss for 28 years. And just learning from the values that were created at the beginning by Jeff and Jim, uh, and it worked. Now, you know, you can only be noble if you're successful, and we've been able to be successful, which right. is honest, noble. Right. Uh, and why Seattle? I mean, I look back. Had Costco been headquartered in some small town in the middle of the state, I would have gone. And because I grew up in Atlanta, I always just find it is I want to go to a city which at least had more than one movie theater and you can actually get in your car and drive places. But funny story, I remember on my first date with whoever out here, it's a Saturday night and we're going to like the act theater or some, something like that. Uh, but then going out for a late dinner on a Saturday night and we had a 9.30 reservation for dinner and we got there around 9.45 says you need to order quickly because, and this was like a hip, it was called the Rain City Cafe, I think. I you remember know, the Rain City Cafe. The, the Rain City, the brothers hanging from the ceiling. And uh, I don't know what I had for dinner last night, by the way, but I can remember that. And, and but I remember, I honestly remember it was closing at, and we need to put an order in because the kitchen closes at 10. This was a Saturday night in a big city. Yeah, you're city. like, I picked I mean, the wrong city. I, I picked the wrong city. But you know what? It, Seattle's been a great town and doesn't rain as much as people think, notwithstanding today. Well, except for today, it's terrible. And how did you meet Barry? Uh, I, I did my requisite two years when I moved here in the Edgewater Apartments in Madison Park. Those little old ones that you put on. I love the Edgewater. I have a few friends that have lived there. Right. And uh, and uh, and then I moved around the corner to a rental condo that's like a six-story, 90-unit building out on stilts right there in Madison. Mm -hmm. And she lived down the hall. Oh, nice. And over, over this first six months, we ran into, she had a job that traveled. So we didn't see each other, run into each other like mornings and evenings at work, if you will. Uh, but over six months, we ran each other the third time. And no doubt I introduced myself three times and she's thinking, what an idiot. And finally she said, Galanti, is that Sephardic? And, and then she's uh, like, done and done. <laughs> no, no. And it was funny. She was dating somebody at the time and kind of, and I knew because I'd ask her if she wanted to go out, whatever. And so I'd stop by 10 minutes before the date arrived and make her feel uncomfortable. <laughs> That's perfect. That's so we met there and got married a year and a half later. And did she know the rocket ship that she was signing on for? Because you're a workaholic. I mean, I've seen you on vacation several times. You're you're work like you're a worker. I'm, I, I, I fooled a lot of people. I mean, I work hard, but I can also procrastinate on shit. Um, no, well, everybody, look, everybody does that. Look, we uh, we met, we fell in love, and the rest is history. So I don't know. Yeah, I, well, I no, I'm curious. Work. I'm I'm more curious. Like, at what point you realized like the level of the rocket ship that you were on? Like, you did it just it was, did the did the, the goalpost just keep moving? Like, oh, we're gonna have ten warehouses. Oh, let's try for you know twenty. I, I, look, it's happened over thirty-seven years. I think of myself in the last two years more being on a rocket ship because we've had we really truly have good very good fortune and, and good luck. We've been successful in every company that we've operated opened and and we're opening in new countries and not every big box retailer around the world they several of them have gone into other countries and pulled out of several countries because it didn't work. Our concept works and 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 we can go into an Australia or a Korea or a, an Iceland. And, and, and operate as a $200 billion retailer with world-class pricing power and success. And you know what? People like big American stuff at great value and quality. So it's, but when did I realize rocket ship? I think it's, it's been affirmed in an increasing way in the last two years with COVID. Yeah. Well, the two years, I mean, with COVID, I remember running into you and everybody was like SOL because nobody could get toilet paper. And I right. kept thinking, when is the toilet paper going to come back? 
How has the supply well, chain shortage impacted the business? I mean, obviously you're at an all-time high, but what's that um, stress been like, I guess, the last couple of years? Everybody depends on Costco. Well, um, I, I think in some ways we've been, bigger retailers, in fairness, have probably had a better ability to do a better job of, of supply chain. Um, within that, because we're an item business, if we run out of something, we just put something else out there. Uh, and uh, because in many cases, even if Walmart is two and a half times as big as us in total company sales, that's over 100,000 items. We're over 3,800 items. So per item, we dwarf anybody and everybody, whether it's a television set or molasses, you know, and 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 so I think that that's helped us a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, we like like Home Depot and Walmart and Target have uh, at least our own supply ships, two, three small ones. Um, you know, the ones you see on the news are 15,000 containers. These are 1,000 containers. But if they make 10 crossings a year from Asia to North America, that's about 30,000 containers, which is maybe 15% of our need. But it gives us great flexibility. We can make sure the Halloween costumes get in. A lot of retailers, traditional retailers like Target, had very little, if any, Halloween costumes. Yeah. You walked into a Costco, we had everything. Yeah, and so we've been we've done. A, you guys a, always have everything, minus that little well, window. We've, when had, there was, yeah. we've had a better. We've done a better job of that, but I think it's been made easier not only because of our size, but because we have so few items, and, and that getting back yeah. to. Yeah, I'm guessing. Question. I'm guessing the highest um, selling item is it toilet paper, the best selling. It, it, it's water, toilet paper, paper towels, uh, coffee in the aggregate, all the the, the K cups. Um, we've had about 10 or 12 items that are billion dollar a year items. Wow. Um, those ones are those ones that you just said are slightly obvious, but what are some of the others? You don't have to memorize, you probably do have them uh, memorized actually. Oh, ground beef. But yeah, yeah. again, in, ter these are, in terms of an item, you're like Kirk and Sinder toilet paper is one single item, and it's over a billion dollars. Uh, as is Charmin, that's one single item, that's over a billion dollars. We have all kinds of things. I mean, you think about in, uh, in uh, produce, I mean, produce is a seven or eight billion dollar business, which is dwarfs everybody. And yeah. you know, and how much of that is berries? It's is it a billion or a billion two or eight hundred? I don't know off the top of my head. Right. But just the enormity of these things that we have to, you know, we source produce from forty four countries. That's insane. Uh, even though we don't sell, even though we sell maybe a third of the different types of produce that you find in a supermarket. Right. And what's your highest grossing store? Uh, Seoul, Korea, Young J. Interesting. It does, it does almost $500 million. We have a, a half a dozen that do over 400. Uh, a few, a couple of three in California, uh, Iwale, which is Honolulu, uh, Young J, of course. And I mean, the numbers are, it's pretty cool. Um, you it's know, it's really cool. Do you see India as a major growth opportunity? There's no, I mean, obviously day, major India population and no cost. Structure, right. Look, there's a billion people and there's 300 million middle and upper class. Uh, the challenge with India, as I understand, is first of all, it's, it's whole infrastructure is challenging. It may be great in a, a big multi-million population city, but as a country, there's challenges. Until very recently, a foreign company could not own a majority of the company. And we have no interest in having, uh, you know, uh, being a minority holder in something that we're running. Right. Uh, so, but is it one day? I mean, there's, you know, right now our focus, in addition, let's face it, in the U.S. with 550-ish locations, we're still opening about 15 a year in the U.S. Yeah. Uh, in Australia, you know, Australia, which is two-thirds the size of, uh, of Canada, in Canada, we've got 105 locations. In Australia, we have 12. That's such insane growth. And do you, when you're making decisions, I know that as a collective group on the executive team, uh, you personally, are you mostly just looking at data or how much does gut play a role? Well, we're fortunate. We have we have maybe six billion of debt with an average cost sub 2% and 13 billion of cash. So we are in a very strong net cash position. We, unlike a lot of companies, we own 82% of all of our fixed assets, our buildings, our, our infrastructure. Uh, the only things we don't own are where we can't own because it was some developer that did a ground lease for us or something. Right. Um, so that's a little unusual and unique. Um, you know, where I get involved is, is 
aside from you know the county department you know timely and correct information and hopefully useful management tools for everyone for them to run their businesses it reports up to me which uh, you know i mean it's every company today is somewhat of a technology company right but that's the one area in march or february of 2020 unrelated to COVID. Uh, we hired three hires into IT that are at the VP level. That's the first time in 35 years, since the beginning of time that we hired anybody in this company. And, and recognizing IT is different than growing up in operations and merchandising. And, uh, and, uh, and so that's been a little unique for us. And it's worked out well. Well, your app is awesome. I use it all the time. And those are, well, I mean, I'm really critical improved. about that stuff. It's definitely, no, it's it's crushing it these days. It's very, um, the user experience and user interface right. are both but, great. But delete the app and re-put it on. Literally okay. this week, we, we updated it. It's a better app. Okay. Now we got to tell everybody. So I'm, I, he will tell everybody, all, all of our listeners. Um, so what I was asking, I think you heard me say the word debt, but I was saying gut, like, or maybe you did hear that word, but I was saying like, when you're thinking about opening a store, or going into a country, you're obviously there's so much data you can use to analyze the opportunity. But um, well, how, much, how, much, but, how much does gut play a role? Like, does your gut I, I now just, at this point? I now? was just going to say that if you think back to the beginning, Jeff and Jim and some of the other merchants operated, they fly into a city and they spend two days shopping the city, going to the supermarkets, going to the discount stores, looking at traffic flows, getting some basic information on on, uh, on demographics. And you know, number of average household income and population and numbers, small businesses uh, from you know the Coldwell banker of the town or whatever. But at the end of you know the, the commercial real estate people. But at the end of the day, it was also what was referred to as, as Kentucky windage. It was their experience, their sense of the city, and and generally we did pretty good on. You know, and, you know, do we get a good grade doing it that way? Yes. Do we make a lot of mistakes? No. Do we make a few along the way? Sure. Uh, and we always gave them an extra chance to, to work before we, we, we've closed yeah. very few. What were some of the big failures? Not necessarily the specific, like, oh, this store in Wichita or whatever, but just moves like we didn't purchase this or we did purchase that and it failed. I think there are times when uh, there was a location in Queens. It was a great location. And there are two other warehouse club competitors out there. Sam's Club, which is owned by Walmart. And a, and a smaller version of one, which was from the old Zares Corp years ago, called BJ's Wholesale Club. And BJ's is based out of Boston. And our intelligence, or lack thereof, indicated that neither of them were looking in Queens. And so we played hardball with the developer and lost the site. Mm. And so you know, that, that happens a few times. Um, we generally are the site of preference for a developer because you know the average cost in America does 280. The average Sam's does about 110. The average Big Days does sub 80. So I mean, it's it's a staggering difference. I mean, we are the one you want when you know, when a Home Depot or Lowe's is opening, and we all need about 15 acres. If they find a 30 acre site, either of them, we're the first one they call. They're tapping uh, you. And yeah, yeah, interesting. So and, as, and as you've gr- as you've grown into these different markets and done business across the world and become so global, what's been the biggest, I guess, disappointment or challenge in doing business in China? Well, look, we have one unit there that's two years old. The average Costco in the world has about 68,000 households as members. That one has over 300,000. So nothing bad has happened there at all. Uh, we certainly work hard. Uh, we're well known for paying better than average wages. So being a great employer, we have great merchandise. We are opening our second one in December and our third one about 11 months from now, I believe, or you know, late calendar 22. And God willing, there'll be more over time. Well, we're pretty yeah, for sure. about it. Um, you know, in Japan, where we have about 30, and one day we'll have 100 probably or more. Um, uh, in the first five years, we opened six. Uh, and even though it was pretty successful, we're not worried about being, you know, we got to be there and be there big beforehand. Uh, the uniqueness of our operating model allows us to have a few and still be uh, structurally productive in terms of storage and distribution. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and, uh, and we feel very confident that we've got the best mousetrap. Yeah. What are some stories? I know that I saw you got to, um, I was psyched because I got to see you do the um, presentation about 
some of the facts and I loved it. I don't remember them off the top of my head, but some of the, the funny or surprising facts around Costco. What were some of those? That something around hot dogs. Um, well, look, look, we sell one at a time. We help, we sell the hot dog and soda. We sell about 140 million hot dogs and sodas. So much so that we were driving to, there was only, we used to have a kosher hot dog and there's only really two, Hebrew National and Sinai 48. And we were doing so much business, it was driving the cost up. So we went to an all beef kosher style hot dog. I mean, it doesn't have a prayer over it, but, and we perhaps lost a customer or two, but not many. But the reality is, is we built our own hot dog plant in California that makes two items, a big hot dog and a smaller one for families to give their little kids, to give their kids and a 20 pack that we sell inside. We felt that that plant would last for at least five years because it had a capacity of 285 million hot dogs. It hit it in the first year because of how successful the 12 and 20 packs were inside the warehouse. Um, so that's crazy. But we were able to, by, by doing that, we were able to shave about six cents off the cost of the hot dog and soda and keep the price at about 50, which we've kept since the beginning of time back in 84 or five. Um, so it's a, we've improved the hot dog. We, when we went from kosher to our own, we increased the size by 10%. Because we're always about. We're not I love gonna, how much you know these numbers off the top of your head. It's so crazy. The other fun statistics: we're the largest seller of first growth French wines in the world. We're the largest seller of fine wines in the world. If we were a country, we would be, I think, three or four uh, in terms of Dom Perignon sales behind U.S., France, and maybe one other country. Um, we're thirty-five plus percent of all the jumbo cashews grown in the world. Uh, we're something like twelve or thirteen percent of all the blueberries grown. In the world. They're crazy numbers. And, these are uh, these are crazy numbers. Tell me about the services. I mean, all the services are there. Um, I don't even know if I know all the services. Obviously, Costco. Well, I probably don't know them all. There's some of them are consumer services. Some of them are for small businesses, like discount credit card processing for small businesses, uh, forms and check printing for businesses. Um, certainly, we have a travel agency. We have. I, I guarantee you, no matter how smart anybody thinks they are, and they've got the best deal on renting a car at an airport or anywhere, but say you're going, you're going on vacation you're, or you're on business, you're going to be in an airport or a car. Um, and we, we basically use, offer, you know, everybody but hurts because they weren't prepared to deal uh, with our value. No matter how good you are and what affinity program you're affiliated with, rent your, look it up, see the exact price, exact car on the days you want to rent it, and then go to Costco. I'm literally batting a thousand in terms of a better deal. And so how do you uh, go about that? Just Where? Like, Go on the app? Like, I mean, if somebody- go to Costco, Just go on the, go to costcotravel.com or costco.com and put in travel. And whether it's car rentals or vacation packages. And what about getting gas at Costco? How does that compare? My son yeah, drives yeah. there. Max drives. He drives like- Well, when you're, when you're living in a Hollywood suburb, I won't say who, and there's two gas stations near you, and they are, will probably save you 60 to 80 cents a gallon. Right. On average, honestly, but on average- we will across the country, not looking at just the little one gas station in a nice neighborhood. Uh, we'll probably save somewhere between 20 and 35 cents a gallon. Right. Which adds up. For sure. Well, it adds up. And, you know, no pun intended for every hundred people that shop, that fill up with gas, 55 come into the warehouse to shop. Even if one of them is incremental, that's meaningful. As right. Well. Or the other way around. I mean, obviously right. it works better when they go into the warehouse, but sometimes right. but, people plan their gas around their visit to Costco. But our, our gas, the average gas station in America turns their inventory every nine days. So whatever is down below in the tanks. And on average, we all have the same tanks because of, of state and city guidelines. If you're too close to water you know, or streams or whatever, you, you know, you limit how many tens of thousands of gallons you can have underneath uh, in case there's a break. Um, we turn our gas every day. So wow. and like Issaquah, Issaquah gets filled up three times a day. What? It's, these are crazy numbers. These are and insane numbers. What, what are some other st what are some other statistics? Because you're going to keep going. I'm guessing. I don't know how old you are right now, but I don't see you retire. I mean, I don't think you'll retire anytime soon. You, you're so. I'm a procrastinator. <laughs> you're procrastinator. I'm very lucky. I, you know, I said to Jim for years. I say to Craig, and we all agree. You know, very lucky working for a company that's not only been successful, but where your people, your your customers, and your employees like you and trust you. So it's kind of fun. And it's kind of fun being successful you know, and some of the things that we've done. And um, it's kind of fun talking a, a, a high-end manufacturer or supplier of some good that never would sell us to agree to sell us. And then we just blow the numbers away in terms of their expectations. Um, and 
because we're, we're kind of the high-end retailer in the discount business. Oh, for sure. For sure. Yeah. And so when you're trying to not work and you're trying to relax besides napping, which you, I know are prioritizing when you're getting your MBA and probably still today, what are you doing to just have fun, straight up have fun? Are you able to turn off like the whole work thing? I don't think I'm, I turn off completely. You know, my wife and I were on a lovely back so road. You're, you're, you're six day. I have that in here. Yeah, I know. I saw pictures and I spoke with Elaine oh, and Bobby. Yeah, but, like, tell me about that. Six days of riding bikes. Yeah, 150, 200 mile bike right Now they were electric bikes. My favorite word, my favorite new word is the boost uh, or turbo <laughs> on the bike. But at the end of the day, uh, I was able to turn off completely. Does that mean that, truly completely, does that mean that I don't look at emails for half an hour? Absolutely, I look at them. I'm, it's just, I find it therapeutic, frankly. Yeah, I get that yeah. completely. When people are like, oh, just check out your out of office on, I'm like, that's not relaxing for me. It's more yeah, relaxing I, I, to check. Uh, several months ago, I took a six week sabbatical. My wife was, and, and the, I think it's the first sabbatical in Costco's history, by the way. Uh, and there were some personal things that we needed to get done, from, you know, everything from some estate planning stuff to, cleaning out my office and closet at home and just stuff that I haven't gotten around to doing. And she wanted me to take four months off. And I said, <laughs> laughed and said, no way. We got it down to six weeks. The first three days, that Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, week one, I was at the office the whole day. Uh, anyway, we did get through it. And I would say it was half successful. And it wasn't successful completely because of me, you know, because I probably took it. Did you get your closet stuff. cleaned out? Got the closet cleaned out. That's a big accomplishment. I can't get David to do that. We're working on it. I have That's somebody that will help. Them. <laughs> it was funny. If there That's were, a big one. If 10 years ago we did it once and there were 80 polo shirts hung up and I threw away 60 of them, there were 20, easily 18 or 19 of those 20 just had more dust on them than 10 years since. That's so funny. So I know you don't like to wake up early. You said like, that's a big pet peeve, but what would you get up early to do besides work? Is there something that's like an outside well, do, passion yeah. or hobby? Well, one thing I do, and I try to do twice a week on Saturdays and Sundays, I've gotten into the habit of going on like two-hour walks up and down hills. And we'll start at my house usually because it's at the lowest elevation in the neighborhood and walk up and down some serious hills and through trails and stuff. And I'll do it with either three to five buddies or my wife and I and another couple and our dogs. And the good news about it, it doesn't hurt like real working out. You don't get Charlie horse two weeks in for the first two weeks of it. And it is exercise. Totally. And, and you do feel it. You do feel good about it. So I usually we're getting up. It's somewhere between 7.30 and 8, closer to 8.30 most times. Yeah. Uh, occasionally 7.30 and walk first thing in the morning. And then what you find is, is your entire weekend day is more productive and vibrant. Yeah. What's your favorite oh. item? What's your favorite item that you buy consistently? It's like always at your house from Costco. The cashews? Well, the cashews are always there. That's certainly good. The rotisserie chicken, the Kirkland Signature Vanilla Ice Cream with 18% butter fat, which dwarfs Ben & Jerry. Is that, is, that a, is that a lot? I don't even know. That's a lot. That's, That's a lot. so creamy. Yeah. It's not good for the, the waist or the yeah. heart. Well, good thing good. you're going on your walks. That'll You, yeah. gotta, you can't do that. No, you know, you know, certainly those are a few of the great items. I mean, yeah. The, the produce is great, although there's a, you know, they're bigger sizes. We've we've cut down the sizes somewhat because we realize that people are throwing too much away. Um, so that we, is that is a, that's a good point. I mean, I've got a, you've got your kids out of the house now, but we've got all three kids, and even with three kids in the house, sometimes our stuff just turns. Like obviously the pantry is full of Costco, but when I get the produce, sometimes it turns because I mean right. not because it's not good quality, but because no, we because you were so big, right? And so we. There, there's a balancing act. We can't have the smallest size and the three different sizes of it because we won't turn it as fast. And, and, and it's all about the volume turns to, to be able to sell at our low margins or low markups. You've got to yeah. sell more of it. Um, but but I, I think a better example would be something like fresh ground beef or all the skinless chicken breasts. They used to, you know, it used to come in a six or eight pound size. Now it comes into three size, three bags with a serrated plastic. Yeah. Where you can flip it off, leave one in the refrigerator. Well, leave. yeah, and they're all individually, they're like individually right. so we've packaged. Been more of that. Yeah, that makes sense. So um switching gears a little bit. Um, I know you and Barry are very th philanthropic. 
How do you decide where to put your time, your resources, your money? Um, is there a process for that? Or is it just like, oh, I'm, I feel weak right now. I'm getting my, like they're pulling at my heartstrings. Well, I, I think, look, we've been fortunate and I'm sure there are people that are more philanthropic than us and others that aren't, but we're, we're proud of what we can do. I'll tell you a quick, great story. There's a gentleman in town who's passed many years ago, Sam Strong, and I was probably recently married, so I was 34, doing fine, but certainly not as fine as I'm doing today economically. And I remember having lunch in his office. And at the end of the lunch, he said, there's something I want you and Barry to do for me. I go, yeah, I want you to start a supporting foundation, which was a philanthropic way to you know, set up a small foundation. And I actually laughed and I said, Sam, I'm flattered, but we don't have foundation money. I'm thinking of foundation money is like a seven figure number, which throws off a lot of income every year. He says, well, I want you to, I want you to put hundred thousand dollars into a supporting foundation and I'll put in 25. And maybe at the time we were giving away 10 or 15,000 a year and to everything. So if he's putting in 25, that's like a year and a half of free giving. Well, what he was doing, and I'm sure he did it with a few others. I don't know who, but he was taking somebody that seemed to have the opportunity to grow in time, me and Barry. And, uh, and guess what? Once you had 125 in front of you, you gave way more. And part of giving is learning how to give. And I mean that sincerely. Uh, and again, there's people that dwarf us in many ways. But when you're young, even when you're doing well, you, you haven't given before. And you're, you have to learn how to do that process. And then you go through the process. And sometimes you're doing it because you have a personal connection to it, whether it's an illness, a, you know, a disease, or a charity that you're involved with, or you're something that your kids' school's involved with, whatever our friends involved with. Certainly, we know a few people that when we see their number come up on the on the phone, we don't want to answer it, <laughs> jokes aside. But at the end of the day, I think it evolves over time, frankly. And by the way, Costco does something great. Uh, like many companies, United Way is a very good way to give to lots of human yeah. health services in yeah. the where you live. So years ago, they did it. Years ago, 35 years ago, we did a, a campaign called Two Plus Two. We'll you know, take $2 out of your paycheck. You're talking about hourly employees making $8 an hour back then. And we'll match it. So your $54 a year, $52 a year will become 104 And guess what? Once you start doing that, it becomes um, it becomes infectious. You give a little more and, and you're deciding where you want to direct it to. And and I think over, and that's what nearly, let's say what Sam was doing as well. Cross has something else which basically matches 60 cents on the dollar to anything that you, any 501c3 that you want to direct to up to a significant amount of money in the, in the low hundreds of thousands of dollars. So 100 becomes 160. Talk about an incentive to give to 501c3. So, and, and over time, the list gets bigger, God willing. There's more things on the list that you give. And uh, you have to balance it. We try to balance a combination of secular and non secular stuff. Uh, I think it's uh, personally, and I think Barry feels the same way. It's very important since we're involved in certain, uh, you know, religious or non-secular things. Uh, we certainly give to that, but it's important to give to the community and to other things as well. Yeah. And, well, I remember when you guys chaired the United Way. That was, um, that that was, was like so four rewarding. or five years ago. Yeah, it was so rewarding. One, I think we moved the needle a little bit, not as much as certain others before us, uh, but what we learned about some of the organizations that someone like the United Way, all the, the the food banks and the abused women's shelters and and the goodwill, I mean, all the things that we sometimes forget about, learning, uh, you know, disconnected youth, uh, learning that every time you stop and you see somebody with a cardboard sign, of, you know, as, as wonderful as we all think we are personally and charitable, your first inclination is, is they're lazy and they're not working and they're just trying to get some free money. The reality is, is 80% of them or more have mental health and other issues and, and, and don't want to be out there. And, uh, and it's not going to be solved overnight, but what you, it was a great learning experience of meeting some of the, not only the people running these recipient organizations, but meeting some of the people that have been impacted positively by them. Yeah. Well, you guys, you guys have set the bar really high as far as, you know, I look at you as uh, from a philanthropic standpoint as mentors and people that I'm like, gosh, I can't imagine. We try to give away as much as possible also, but just the, the intention you've had around it and just how generous you are, even just with opening your home and um, being real community leaders. I think that you're setting a great example, not just for your kids 
and hopefully down the road, your kids' kids, but just the whole community. It's great. Well, we're lucky, and uh, if we can help a little bit, we try to. Right. I don't know about luck. I think you're creating your luck. Well, I, when, whenever I'm speaking to classes, they say, how did you get to your job? How did you get to be CFO? And I said, I worked my ass off, which created more chances of good luck. because I'm Exactly. And you, rec- and you recognize the luck and you stepped in. Like some yeah. people, like they have opportunities and they just walk right past them because they're fearful or for whatever reason, they have self-doubt and you're, you're showing up for life and you're saying yes. Um, okay, my final question for you, Richard, is what fuels you? Um, I think being part of Costco certainly has because again, I, I don't have to repeat the things I said earlier. I think the other thing, is again, I've had an opportunity over the years to talk to high school seniors, college business classmates, uh, communications classes, uh, executive MBA, you know, all kinds of disconnected youth programs. And probably once a year, I get a letter or an email from somebody that I said something that they remember I said 10 years ago. And it was something that was not the most incredible thing. I mean, it was com- some of it was common sense stuff, but they had not heard it given their own environment and how it changed their trajectory and and thanking me for what I mentioned. And that is really cool. 